Thing. I'm Evelyn Maddox, president of the Missouri League. Our Missouri League has been a participant in the National People Powered Fair Maps campaign since 2018. Empowering voters and defending democracy on a nonpartisan basis is what the League has persisted in doing in Missouri for over 100 years. Fair redistricting is a critical component for a healthy democracy. Tonight's event is just one of many special events that the League of Women Voters in our 50 states are conducting because it is our national day of action for fair maps. Every state is undergoing redistricting, although redistricting methods vary from state to state. You'll learn about Missouri's method tonight. Our mission this evening is to increase grassroots people power in Missouri by promoting public awareness and engagement around the re redistricting process so that redistricting results in fair and fair maps that are nonpartisan prevail. We want to make sure the public's voice is heard as our two Missouri redistricting commissions and our Missouri legislature develop new district boundaries which will apply for the next 10 years. You'll learn more tonight about how that process works and about, <clears throat> excuse me, and about the risk of gerrymandering that can create districts that unfairly advantage or disadvantage a political party. There will be time for a Q&A following the presentation. We want to thank Sharon Schneeberger, our state committee chair, and Jean Dugan, our executive director, for leading the Fair Maps campaign in Missouri. They've had a dedicated team of volunteers who belong to our local leagues located in 10 different areas of Missouri. So Sharon, why don't you now introduce our committee and our guest speaker? Thank you, Evelyn. It is indeed my pleasure to um, highlight the efforts and the names of the committee members. It is wonderful to work with people who are caring and follow through we have a big job though, and we need you too. But the committee members are from Overly, Nancy Copenhaver, from Southwest Missouri, Joan Gentry, from Kansas City, Mary Lindsay, from the Metro St. Louis, Joan Hubbard, Jean Kendall, Nancy Price, Jennifer Rushing, Nancy Thompson, from Columbia Boone County, Marilyn McLeod, Carol Schreiber, and myself. And of course, ex officio on our committee is Jean Maddox, our state president, and Jean Dugan, the executive director who helps us with all of this infrastructure. So now I get to introduce um, our speaker. We're very pleased to have with us this evening and to share with all of us her expertise. Um, Sharon Galway Jones is an attorney and a policy professional in Missouri. She advocates on behalf of her clients in the Missouri legislature and has been doing this since 2002. Her specialty is working with advocacy groups to make their voices heard, especially when their issue is unpopular in the legislature. She's written multiple articles for professional publications and is a frequent speaker on issues of advocacy and legal strategy. Sharon earned her Juris Doctorate from the University of Missouri Columbia School of Law in 2012 while working as the director of Government Relations for the Missouri Association of Trial Attorneys. Every year since 2013, she has been on the Missouri Times 100 People to Know list. She resides in Columbia, Missouri, and we are really pleased that she has chosen to share her expertise and her time with us now. Great, thanks. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I can't tell if I've been part of the group mute. Good. So thank you so much, Sharon, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, 
I was part of the Clean Missouri campaign, both the first and the second time. And I know that internally, we always really value the League of Women Voters and the people power that you all bring to the table for sure. So I'm really happy to be able to tell you how you can take that into this next phase of what is really the same project, which is trying to get fair maps in Missouri for the next 10 years. So I have put together a little presentation because I can't help but do that. Uh, so let's see if I can make this screen share work correctly. Perfect. Oh, no, that's not. Okay, can everyone see a PowerPoint? Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so um, when I was asked to do this, I thought, well, what, what do I really need to share with you all that you won't already know? And the real question on everyone's mind, I think, is can we stop this thing? So I wanted to answer three questions within that question, which is what do we mean when we say gerrymandering? How is this next year's process going to be any different? And what can we all do to be a part of it? I'm going to try to answer those and um, I know that there's time for Q&A at the end, so please, I have a tendency to sometimes use jargon. If there's a, something I say that you don't understand, feel free to either interrupt or save it for when we get to Q&A and I will uh, go back and explain more. So first, what do we mean when we say gerrymandering? For those of you who don't know, the term actually comes from Governor Elbridge Gary. I don't know why we pronounce it differently, but we do. So uh, he was the governor of Massachusetts in the 1800s, and the term was invented by the Boston Globe, who was critical of a map that he had signed. And supposedly he also didn't like the way that these districts turned out, but he had drawn or, or signed the bill that gave this really weird district that wrapped all the way around a bunch of others and created what the Boston Globe thought looked like a very scary salamander. So they came up with the name gerrymandering. Unfortunately, his efforts worked, which is probably why it stuck. And he managed to overturn the Federalist Senate or the Federalist control of the state Senate by drawing this weird district um, and, and coming up with a new electoral result. So that's what we mean when we say gerrymandering, that, that a district or multiple districts have been drawn to achieve a specific result. In a perfect map of, for legislative map, you would have the statewide vote match the division of the legislature. So if you've got a 55-45 statewide vote in favor of a party, the legislature would look about the same way, even, pretty evenly divided. Gerrymandering has been used to make sure that that doesn't happen and that one party over another has an unfair advantage within the legislature. It has also been used historically to suppress racial and language uh, communities and prevent them from having a strong voice in the legislature. The real problem with this is that the people in those districts no longer have an incentive to listen to the will of their voters or vote the way their district does. The only people they need to care about are the party leadership and their donors because everything is about not getting a primary, you know, um, making sure that you've got money in your bank account to play in political leadership races, things like that. So when the legislators are no longer accountable to the voters, we end up with the mess that we have in the Missouri legislature this year, for example, where they are just flat out refusing to fund constitutionally mandated programs like Medicaid. It's not the only one, but that's not what this talk is about tonight. So I'm not gonna run down that rabbit trail. So the way we determine whether or not a map is fair is through a partisan fairness score, which is also called an efficiency gap. There's a ton of math involved, I'm not great at math. So I just created this little example so we can run through it and you can see sort of what you're looking for. How you get to what the efficiency gap is, is by calculating each party's wasted votes. 
It's an unfortunate term, but what it means is every vote that is in excess of what you needed to win and every vote that was cast for a losing candidate. The efficiency gap is based on your entire map, not just each individual district. And you know that was a big thing that we had to keep explaining over and over through both of the clean campaigns. We're not trying to get to 50-50 districts, we're trying to get to an overall map that matches a statewide vote. So again, this is one way that you do that. Generally, fair scores are going to be under 7%. This example is a little bit skewed because there are only five districts in it. But if you look at this little chart that I've made, you've got five districts and the D's and the R's are listed out there. You can see that you've got two Democratic districts and three Republican districts across the map as a whole. So again, how you get to those wasted vote scores is the uh, Democrats only needed 51 votes to win. So 29, yeah, 24 of their votes were wasted. You subtract those from the Republican wasted votes, which were 25, and you get to one net wasted vote for Republicans. Then you do that across each of these districts to get your net wasted votes in each district. Then what you do is you add up each party's wasted votes and see what that net result is. So with our little example, you end up with 101 more Democratic wasted votes than you had Republican. When you divide that by the total vote cast, you get an efficiency gap score of 20%, which is absolutely horrendous. To show you how truly horrendous that is, and Jean has these and, and can share them with anyone who wants to play with this chart, but this is the absolute lowest efficiency gap score you could have with just those five districts. The lowest efficiency gap score you could have is 9.8. So in our previous example here, it's almost twice as bad as perfectly you know, fair. So when you do that across a real world example, obviously the math gets a lot more complicated and there are a lot more numbers involved. But again, you're trying to get under that 7%. And luckily we have a lot of professionals and academics who figured all this out. So I'm giving you the very shorthand version so all that to say, when we are talking about the efficiency gap or partisan fairness, what it means is that we are trying to get to either, well, really we're trying to get to under seven in a realistic world. In a perfect world, your efficiency gap would be zero. There would be just as many wasted Republican votes as there are Democratic votes. That's not practical. So seven is sort of our target. Um, so to show you, that's, that's the theory. Here's the application. Currently, Missouri's partisan fairness efficiency gap is 8% for the House and 14% for the Senate uh, in favor of the Republicans. That means that we are already in our current position in a place where our map is skewed in favor of the Republicans. And we know that internally, like we, we feel that anecdotally. And we can see that in the fact that we have, you know, 80% super majorities in both of those chambers but our statewide votes are always closer to 55, 45, 60, 40. So again, taking that down to the practical, what does this mean? Why is this important? If you look at 2018 and 2020, these are how many races were without partisan opposition. So there were 97 out of 163 House members in 2018 
that had no significant opposition. And uh, 18 Senate seats. So that meant all of the Senate seats that were up in 2018 were really without significant opposition. Um, then if you look at 2020, that can't be. Oh, I see what they did. I pulled those numbers off of a different presentation. They must have done the whole thing, the whole Senate. Anyway, when I looked at 2020, I just looked at the seats that were up. Uh, the odd seats were up in 2020. So again, 83, so again, more than half of the House was without significant opposition and seven of the 18 Senate seats that were up were without significant opposition. This is not good for us. This, this means that everything is baked in beforehand. And again, no one feels the need to talk to their representative or talk to their voters because that's not who they're representing. They're more worried about primary challenges and that sort of thing. So we know there's a problem. There's very, very clearly a problem. Let's figure out how this process is going to work. And before I run into this, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. So I've been around, I started in politics with uh, Joe Maxwell and um, back in 2000. And so I was kind of here for that round of redistricting, and then I was more involved in the 20, 2010 round. In both of those, what you saw is a lot of incumbent protection and a lot of the commission choosing who they want to run for which seats and choosing which House members they want to run for which Senate seats and things like that, and drawing as uh, former Representative Copenhaver knows all too well, drawing specific people's houses in and out of districts. And it resulted in the vast majority of races being so one-sided that you didn't have to worry about it. You didn't have to worry, is this going to be a Democrat seat or a Republican seat? That number of swing districts has shrunk every year since 2000. So when the very first race that I was really involved in was Randall Relford up in Northwest Missouri. And at that time it was a special and the Senate was evenly divided 1717. That was 20 years ago. Now we have 24 Republicans and 10 Democrats in the Senate because of that erosion of between the 2000 and the 2010 redistricting, making those incumbencies so strong that there's no chance they're gonna lose. The only truly competitive districts in Missouri, there are about 30 on the House side and maybe eight, nine, 10 on the Senate side that are really something where no one knows who's gonna win. It's a toss up. Um, and, Again, I could go into all kinds of specific examples, but I've seen it over and over where the people sitting around the table are saying, well, we're gonna draw this district for Caleb Jones, who then doesn't even run, or we're gonna draw this district for, um, you know, to make sure that we put these two house members that we don't really like together into the same house district and then they have to fight it out. We're trying to get away from that. And you would think, okay, the commission can do that. And then won't the judges say, we're not going to do that. Yes, except that the judges tend to look at the two maps that they've been given and make a few adjustments and come to something that's fair-ish. They don't generally redraw the map and the only data they are given in the, these last couple of rounds has been from those commissions and the uh, state demographer. So let's talk about how we can fix that through this new process. It's not as good as clean Missouri, 
but it's probably better because we do have some criteria. So let's start with that. The, the first thing that's different is criteria. Prior to this year, the only criteria was as equal population as possible, and it needs to be contiguous and compact. And you use, um, which is still a state employee who's not the same as the nonpartisan demographer, but you use the state demographer to pull your data and make sure your maps are right ish. In 2020, or 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 2020, we've got a lot more criteria. They flipped the clean Missouri criteria on its head, but again, there is still some criteria. So we need equal population. They threw in there one person, one vote, which we think they are going to try to use to play games. And it has to be within a pretty small deviation. Um, this deviation for some context is so very low that the only state that comes even close to that is Wyoming, where everybody lives in one area and the rest of it is empty. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this, uh, this equal population, one person, one vote, and the very small deviation is definitely going to cause some challenges that uh, I don't think were necessarily anticipated in addition to the ones that they were expecting. Then there are some racial community protections. They are fairly weak. They are probably weaker in reality than the Voting Rights Act. But as long as the Voting Rights Act is in place, it trumps what is in our constitution. So for whatever that's worth, there is some protection there. The districts still need to be compact. There's a preference for geometric shapes. And then you uh, need to keep political subdivisions intact as much as possible. Then they put in the partisan fairness and competitiveness. So that score we were talking about with efficiency gap is still something that needs to be considered. It's just at the end of the list. You all may remember the way Clean Missouri went, it was equal population based on total population, stronger racial community protections, then partisan fairness, then political subdivisions, then compactness. But again, they're, they're all still there. And we do still have a state demographer who is just a regular state employee with some uh, demographics and mapping education. The commissions are a little bit different this year. So in uh, 2010 and earlier, House Commission was all nominated by congressional district committees. Senate Commission was all nominated by the state party. There were 16 on the House and 10 on the Senate. This year, we've made them larger and made the nominations come from a combined uh, congressional district committee and state party committee process for both commissions. So those meetings are getting ready to happen, but the nominations, each party needs to nominate 21 people for each commission. So that's a total of 42 names. And from those, the governor will pick 20 members for each commission to serve. Uh, so they're, it's a lot bigger um, and I'm not really sure how that is going to work. I'm a little surprised they didn't make it an odd number, but I suppose I'm happy that they didn't because uh, that would have meant probably an extra Republican on each. The timeline is pretty unchanged except for the fact that we're starting four months late. So the commissions will be, have to be appointed by July 26th. Um, the original census data was handed down last Monday. So that's April 26th. So that's, that's the date that everything is based off of. So commissions will be appointed by July 26th. They have to set up all their rules and put out their public meeting schedule no later than August 12th then they've got essentially five months to draft a map and make it public. 
during those five months, they may or may not have public hearings and may or may not take public input. Um, I would suggest that we go ahead and give them our input, even if they're not officially taking it. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Then on December 26th, 27th, the 26th is a Sunday. So that will probably mean that they'll push it to the 27th. The draft map is made public and then they have 15 days to have public hearings on that map and officially take input. This is where everybody needs to come out. Even if we've already submitted stuff, these, these public hearings, they have to have at least three. They normally do them in St. Louis, Kansas City and Springfield. And sometimes they'll do a fourth one in Jeff City. Um, they Again, it's a minimum of three, but they can have as many as they want within those 15 days. Then January 26, they have to give a final map to the Secretary of State. That's, uh, I should have put an asterisk there because uh, there's the problem of getting those votes. If they can't get 14 out of the 20 commissioners to agree, the map does not pass and it goes to the judges redistricting commission. And those judges are six appellate court judges that are appointed by the Supreme Court of Missouri. And they will act in their capacity as commissioners, not as judges. And we are trying to do a little bit of education before they ever get appointed to the appellate judges to explain to them, this is not like every other suit or dispute that you hear as a judge. This is not which of these maps is the most fair. As the, as the judges redistricting commission, they are serving as commissioners and need to draw the maps anew. Uh, they will have access to all of the commission work and public testimony, which again is why it is so important to get in our testimony as many times and as many ways as possible. The judges will then have 90 days to draw new maps. They don't have a public hearing requirement, but they do normally have at least one public hearing. And for them, it's just a simple majority to pass the map. Let's say these maps are terrible, completely unfair. What can we do about it? Well, only a voter who is in a district that has a violation can bring the suit and only if that violation can be cured by redrawing the line. The legislature very intentionally have made it nearly impossible for us to bring suit. The only remedy that we're allowed to do is redrawing lines of a district that has a violation. So you can't say there's a violation in this district, let's redraw the entire map. You can only adjust the lines around that district in order to cure that violation. A suit generally cannot throw out the whole map then. However, uh, the legal minds agree that if the map as a whole has a significant problem, so if, for example, they say one person, one vote means only people over the age of 18 who are eligible to register to vote, that would be a big enough problem that we would then not be challenging the map, we would be challenging the process and the language of the Constitution. So in that case, we could challenge the map as a whole and try to overthrow or overturn and redraw the map. It is not clear um, how long that would take. So we're, we're kind of looking at filing for legislative office will start in February of next year. And if you remember the uh, the timeline has a final map going to the Secretary of State and not until the end of January. So there will just be a couple of weeks for people to figure out which district they're in um, and decide if they want to run for that or not. 
that creates other problems. But between that and the fact that we don't know if we're going to have to challenge the map and the process as a whole, we're kind of thinking it's likely people will be running on this current map, at least for the 2022 election, um, which is has happened in other states. It's not the worst thing in the world, but um, it's certainly not what we would think is ideal. So let's talk about what we can do to be involved in this process. And again, this group is so invaluable to getting people to these hearings, which are always scheduled in times that are hard for people to get to and travel. So that is why I'm so grateful to talk to you tonight about what you can be doing. So the first thing is serve as a commissioner. I'm not sure where the Democratic or Republican parties are as far as finalizing their list of names. I know that meetings will be happening over the next couple of weeks uh, through May, and they're going to try to get their names to the governor by um, early June, which is ahead of schedule, which would be good. So if you do want to do this, contact your Democratic or Republican party to volunteer. I don't know if you know who your county committee chair or vice chair is or contact the state party directly and just say, hey, here's my name, address. I've lived here for a year. I'd love to serve. Let me know if I can. And again, each party needs to nominate two people and none uh, or 21 people for each commission. So that's 42 total. And they cannot live in the same house district. So that starts to make getting that list of 42 people can be challenging, especially in some of the rural areas. The second thing you can do is be an advocate, which you're all very good at. We need to start contacting the commissioners when they're nominated and make a couple of suggestions. First, that they they tell us more than they have to, that they go above and beyond when it comes to transparency and share the data as they're working with it. The only time they have to turn over the data that they used to make the maps is when they release the draft map. However, if we know what they're doing ahead of time, we can respond to it a little bit better, prepare for it a little bit better, and frankly, we may even decide that what we want to do is um, go ahead and file suit even before we see the map if we know that they're using bad data. Uh, again, advocate for more public meetings than the minimum three. Advocate that they start having them earlier, things like that. Just trying to get that transparency about the map drawing process. And then finally, when you're talking to them, talk about fairness as opposed to incumbent protection. Talk about communities as opposed to geographic boundaries. Uh, you know, some of the things that I think about are what do you call yourself around town? So, for example, where I live in Columbia, we're the old Southwest. That's not really on a map anywhere, but everyone kind of knows what you mean if you say I live in Old Southwest. So is that something that's considered a community and what does it look like if we base a community off of that? Or you know, what, what would it look like if, um, you know, my parents actually live in Marshfield, Missouri, but if they're out of the state, they just say they live in Springfield. So does that mean that they should be more of that kind of like is that part of the community so does that mean that webster and green should be a senate district you know that sort of thing um talking about that as opposed to just where's the river where's the county line where's the city boundary things of that nature monitor every available public portal the office of administration in missouri normally puts something together uh, as soon as the redistricting process gets started keep an eye on it come to the public hearings when they start. The congressional redistricting um, will happen during a special session. 
We think probably September, October is when they'll have that special session. The House Congressional Redistricting Committee had meetings while they were in town for regular legislative session and heard from different sitting Congress people and um, other experts, I guess you would call them, just sort of theoretically talking about what the congressional map would look like. So they've kind of gotten started on that, but they can't do anything until we get real numbers, which won't happen until August. And when I say real numbers, so the, the Census Bureau said, here's the total population for Missouri, but they haven't broken that down to the precinct ward census block level. So we can't redistrict until we have that breakdown. Once we have that breakdown, then we can start actually drawing maps. And that is not likely to come to us until August. Um, the legislative redistricting commissions will schedule their public hearings. Senate and House will likely have their hearings on the same day, if not at the same time. Um, and then tell your friends and neighbors, tell them that this is happening, tell them how they can be involved, encourage them to go online. If you've got someone who's a younger activist, who's really computer savvy and trying to figure out what they can do, encourage them to go and find the, the various um, community map drawing software that's out there and get involved because we certainly need the next generation to uh, step up. Um, and that brings me to the community mapping project. So uh, Sean Nicholson has been doing some trainings on this and I know he's planning to do a lot more. So again, we're trying to find the communities of interest. Race and color are protected, but other communities are not. That includes things like the Bosnian community in St. Louis, which is a language community. Or, um, you know, if you've got other large blocks of, you know, all of the Catholics live in this part of town or something. So think about what does a community mean and make some descriptions and, and draw some lines based on that. When you're doing that, draw the communities that are in your area. You don't have to worry about the rest of the state. You can just say, hey, I know, you know, um, Cooper County incredibly well, so I'm going to draw where I think Cooper County's division should be. Um, and that that is helpful. We need as many options as we can get. And this goes back to the judges. So again, in the last two rounds, they've essentially had two maps that they're looking at, one that the Republicans voted for and one that the Democrats voted for on the commission. And they kind of try to reconcile and harmonize those two maps. Our goal is to give them a hundred maps so that when they're trying to draw what will be the final map, they're not just hearing from two partisan groups who are interested in incumbent protection they're hearing from the people that live in those areas who say, hey, it doesn't make any sense for me and my neighbor to be in two different districts, that drawing the line here doesn't make sense. Um, so we're trying to give them as much information as possible to try to uh, feed into that. And again, Sean's, Sean's very good and doing trainings. And I think he's doing one specifically for League of Women Voters shortly. Um, so he, he can help you figure out how to do the drawing. So that, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty of what we're talking about and what we can do to fix it. I see a few questions. Let's see. Explain the wasted vote concept again and how it's calculated. Sure. I didn't want to run out of time. <laughs> also, Nancy is going to help moderate the questions. So just get started and she's going to help you out. Oh, great. Okay, so when, can people see my mouse arrow? 
Yeah. Okay. So again, here's your list of districts. And here are the number of people that voted for the Democrat in each district and the number of Republicans that voted for the Republican or number of people that vote for the Republican in each district. So when you find out the wasted votes, you, you take how many people are in total voting in this district. And so how many would you need to want to win? There are a hundred people who are voting in each of these five districts. So you need 51 to win. So the first thing you do is say, okay, let's take the number of votes for the winning candidate and subtract 51 from that. So 75 minus 51 is 24, okay? So there are 24 Democratic wasted votes. Every vote for a Republican is wasted because the Republican lost. So there are 25 Republican wasted votes. You take the higher number and subtract the lower number to get the net wasted votes, which in district one here is one Republican wasted vote. You do that across each of the districts and then you add up all the Republican wasted votes, which is 32 and all the Democratic wasted votes, which is harder, but 84, 133. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, and you subtract again, the lower number from the higher number, which gives you 101 extra Democrat wasted votes across this whole map. Then you divide that number of wasted votes by the total number cast. So 101 divided by 500 gives you 0 0.202 or 20.2%. And I'm not a statistician, but what this means is that, well, here, I think I actually put it in the notes so I can read it and say it right. Okay. In other words, Republicans were better able to convert their votes into legislative seats. They were more efficient. As a result, they won 20% more seats than, the Demo than they would have if both parties had had an equal number of wasted votes. So if this were completely equal, then uh, it would have been a 0% efficiency gap and the Republicans would have had one less seat, but you can't have 0.5 seats. But anyway, um, which means that they won one extra seat than they would have if the map were perfectly even. So that's what we mean when we say efficient, we mean that the Republicans were more efficient with their votes than the Democrats were. And there is, so this, um, and I can send this to Jean, this, this theory is from an academic who was trying to figure out, is there a apples to apples way to look at maps in different states and say, which state is doing this the best? And they came up with this math and method uh, to do that. So I can, I'm gonna make a note so I don't forget. Send Jean Brennan Center paper. And I'm sure it, it really is my weakness. So I'm sure there are those of you who will understand it better if you read it from them than the way I'm trying to explain it. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep. Uh, thank you to whoever put the contact information for the chairs of the parties into the chat. That's great. So your individual maps are actually available um, on the House and Senate websites, or let's see if I can do this without creating a bunch of technological drama. The Office of Administration in Missouri um, has a redistricting page. Let's see if I can find it. Mm 
The redistricting office. So this is, and this will be the same place that you'll go once they get started on this year's. You can see the 2010 plans are here um, with the archived processed information. So it, and again, all of this will be there as they get started in the 2020 process. So you'll see the archived plans. This is what actually came out of it. These new house districts are there. The new Senate districts are there the list of commissioners, all of that. So all of this data is available um, on the OA office. And I will put that link in the chat. There we go. Uh, let's see. Nancy, will you please um, find some questions? Sure. Um, there's one more that was put in there um, that I know of that if um, thing if it's is it possible that if things get really difficult to meet the deadlines that a the current districts can be used in 2022 or b they'll move the deadline for filing further out in Missouri because I know different states are different. Yeah. So. They could do either of those things. Um, in order to move the deadline for filing, they would have to pass a bill either in a special session or at the very beginning of the 2022 legislative session. Don't know if you've noticed, it's not real easy for our legislature to agree on anything these days. So we suspect it will just be that the old maps will be used. And um, that's not an unheard of thing for states to do and generally the courts uphold it. And what they say is you run for the district of the old map and then you serve the district of the new map. And it ends up with some weird things like uh, you may remember Harry Kennedy who served in the Senate in, during the 2010 redistricting. And because they completely changed the numbering scheme he was living in South St. Louis, but he was actually representing Franklin County, which was about 50 miles away from his house. So th that's not an unusual thing to do. Um, it's not ideal. Didn't but Senator Julie Justice do that too? Yes, she did. And yes, she Rambo, and she was like in Callaway County, but living in Kansas City. Yep, that's right. Yep, Julie had it happen to her too. So it's, it's again, um, it's not unheard of. And it's much more likely to happen with the House districts, I think. The, the way the Senate districts are, unless we've had some pretty major uh, population shifts, St. Louis isn't a, likely to change a whole bunch, especially if they're protecting um, communities of color. Green County is pretty much stuck where it's at. Boone County may get its own seat, but you know, the, I think you're likely to see a little bit of shift around the Senate map. The House District map will be significantly different um, because the districts are smaller, and so you're not having the rural problem of there's a lot of land mass and not a lot of people. Um, but yeah, they, it is likely that people will be running under the old map and serving under the new map. The, the next question was, do you think they will activate the one person, one vote option? I do, I do. And I'm not sure um, how they're going to do it. There are a variety of options and I know that we will be considered a test case. Uh, we are the only state that has put that in the Constitution, I think. Um, we were prior to the 2020 election, and I don't think anyone passed one in 2020. So we will definitely be the test case, and the temptation is just too large. There's, there's no way they're not going to try to make that mean something other than total population. 
I also think that's the case because of a little weird thing they did where in the rest of the constitution, when it talks about redistricting, it actually uses the word apportionment. And when it talks about apportionment, it talks about total population. When they rewrote this section of the constitution, they took out apportionment and replaced it with redistricting, which makes me think they wanted to make sure that they could play with the idea of what does one person, one vote mean and not have to worry about conflicts in other portions of the constitution. So I, I feel pretty certain that it is not going to be a total population map. Okay, the next one would be previously data on the voter turnout was part of data included in total data used for drawing districts. Is that true this time around? It, it may be part of what they use. Um, and I, I think they do that to make sure you don't have a weird result where you, again, especially in the house districts because they're smaller, where you don't have a weird result where you're counting the college students because that's where they go through the census, but none of them are registered there. So, you know, um, Maryville, for example, you could end up with a very small number of people who are actually registered to vote in the district as compared to those who answered the census there. And if you have that, even if you're using total population, you may want to put more population into that district than you do in its neighboring districts to make up for uh, that anomalous result. But it, it is usually just a double check and not actually used to draw the lines. Okay, shouldn't redistricting be done more often than 10 years due to population shifts? The reason we do it every 10 years is because that's when the official census happens. So in an ideal world, maybe, but um, it would be impractical to have a full census the way that we do a real census as opposed to the American community surveys. Um, those, the American community surveys, for those of you who don't know, are done every year by the Census Bureau. And they are polling, basically opinion polling, where they go and, and invite a select number of people in an area to answer a very detailed list of questions that is everything from what job do you do to what is your gender identity and sexual orientation to, you know, do you want to have kids to, you know, how, how many hours a week do you spend caring for your elderly parents? All kinds of questions. Um, but they are not, they do not send them to everyone everywhere. And there is no requirement for them to collect the data back. So they're not good. Um, it's not good data to use for something that is as detail oriented as uh, redistricting. So it, it, you would have to, you know, double, triple the Census Bureau's budget to do a full census more than every 10 years. And you have to change the U.S. Constitution. Yeah, I was going to say, we do it because it's mandated in the Constitution every yeah. 10 years. I do think the wording is um, at least every 10 years, so oh, you okay. could theoretically do it. But again, it would be a massive undertaking and um, I don't And we it. can never agree to spend the money. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> all right, so um, another question is, this says that fair scores are under 7%. I think you had a slide that says that the current Republican majority in the House has an 8% score which seems close to being fair. Yet, the total number of seats currently held by one party is a supermajority. Yeah, so there is, I'm gonna share my screen again so you all can see this website, because it is, it is fun. Uh, there is a not-for-profit called Plan Score. Um, 
that does those calculations for us. And you can see they've got back a good number of years. So for the state house in Missouri, they give us an 8% score. But if you look, um, getting nerdy statistically, we are way far over here as compared with the balance and with other states. So yes, it's only a 1% difference, but it's pretty significant when you compare it with how most plans work. Um, and let's see, I think it also may well be that, yeah, yeah if, I, if I hover, you can see. So the Republicans had 1.9 million wasted votes and the Democrats had 2.7 million wasted votes. So again, that 1% is, um, is exponentially impactful on how the map turns out. And let's see, if you click on this, it, I love this website. So, and, and also I think that the fairness, the balance line, um, may change, but uh, and I don't, again, I'm not the math person, but you can go back and look. So in 2002, we were slightly better at 7%. In 92, we were straight up and down balanced. So that's what I mean when I say we went in that 2000 redistricting, we went a little bit to the far side and then in 2012 we really jumped and again it's one percent but it's significant in, in its uh, actual impact but yeah I encourage you again this is planscore.org and uh, they have a lot of it's a lot of fun and they've got a place where once you learn how to make your community maps you can upload your own plan and you have it scored Okay, we've got another question. Who appoints the judges on redistricting and what restrictions are there on appointments? So the, uh, the judges are appointed by the Supreme Court that is usually done by the Chief Justice of the, of the Missouri Supreme Court, not the US Supreme Court. And there is no restriction other than they have to be a sitting appellate court judge. They, Last time around, they tried to do a balance. So there are six judges. And I, I think, and Nancy, tell me if I'm wrong. I think they tried to do three that were appointed by Democratic governors and three that were appointed by Republican governors. Um, yeah. So they attended a couple of those meetings. Mm -hmm. But in reality, those judges don't really do the work. Yeah. They, take the work done by the political parties and put it into effect. Isn't that correct? Is that my assumption or? Yeah, no, that, that is how they've been doing it. The way that the language is written, that's not how they should do it. So we are working with um, several of the interest groups to try to get some education to the appellate court judges before we get to that point. To, so for example, we're trying to have a uh, former Supreme Court judge, Mike Wolf, write a article talking about how as, as a judge, when you're in this role, you're not a judge anymore. You're, you're a redistricting commissioner. You need to act like a redistricting commissioner, draw your own conclusions, draw your own map. But yeah, it, it, in the past, they've always just said whatever we'll we'll figure out between these two parties how we're going to do something that's in the middle so you're hopeful this year might be better i am um and i and i think that it's also because because it's a new section of the constitution because there's so much extra attention being paid to it because uh, there are 
lawsuits all around the country that have been going on for the last 10 years about redistricting. I think that the atmosphere will be a little bit different. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll, they'll do better than they have in the past. Um, then from um, one of our members, look at what was done in 1980 when we lost one seat due to a census count. The League of Women Voters filed suit asking the judges to redraw and they did. Um, but that, now the law is different in Missouri, right? Not for congressional. We didn't make, no changes were made to congressional redistricting in 2020 or 2018. So um, if, and we're not losing a seat again this year, um, or if we are, I've been neck deep in the legislature and missed that somehow, but- No, uh, officially we're not. Okay, officially we're not. The official word came out. We weren't supposed to, um, but, the for congressional stuff, it's, it's its own process. It's done through the legislature. The standing to sue over that is the same as it's always been. The league could file suit, ACLU, NAACP, any of those sort of usual or all together is more likely to happen. Um, and file suit based on any criteria. The legislative redistricting is what we've been talking about, which is the new process with some restrictions on who can sue and, and why and when. Um, again, there's a little bit of a, a legal loophole there where if we're not talking about my district is wrong, if we're talking about the process used to draw the map was unfair or unconstitutional, I think we're still going to have that same standing with all of the voter protection groups to file suit on their own based on the criteria of uh, unconstitutional data. So if they try to use citizen voting age instead of total population, where will they find the data? That's where we get back to the um, Census Bureau's American Community Survey. So if they go to citizen voting age, first of all, in, in the census, um, well, it, what they will do is they will statistically look at the American Community Survey, they will look at the actual census data, and they will have people who do very complicated math figure out based on the last 10 years of data and what we know of people's age, where are we at? And um, you know, the census data has people's age on it. So they will give a number. And the census data normally does, when we get that full data release, it will have age, uh, immigration status, um, all of that in it as good hard numbers. And then it will have some of those statistical uh, extrapolations of, well, you know, we know that we only really get 70% response on the census. So we think that there's actually an extra 30% of people in this area. And here's what we think that actual that 30% looks like, or, you know, well, we, we believe based on the community survey and immigration records and everything else that you actually have a really high population of undocumented residents who didn't answer the census. So we're going to give this area, you know, they divide everything up by census block. So we're going to give these census blocks a boost because we think there are actually more people there who didn't respond. And those numbers are where you kind of get into your squishy one person, one vote. What does that look like? But that they get all of their data from the Census Bureau. The question is just, and, and that's why the fight over whether or not immigration status was included in the census itself was such a tough and important fight. If it had been included as just a straight up question on the census, 
that would have likely depressed the answers even more, uh, which would have led to there having to be more math done to try to get to full numbers as opposed to just saying, this is what the census says. So um, yeah, the, the Census Bureau will release all kinds of statistics uh, and that's where you also end up getting numbers like how many people uh, live on a farm in Missouri, how many cows are there in Missouri, all that kind of weird stuff. All of that will come from the Census Bureau. It's just a matter of how high of a quality data set is it, but it all comes from the same place. So Nancy, do you have one more question and we will um, close our questions? Um, let's see. Um, how about, uh, explain the commission selection process, because we don't hear too much about that. What information will the commission members receive? How will commissioners receive feedback from citizens? And will, will there be public hearings for citizen input? So the commissioners are chosen, uh, the, each congressional district committee chooses two people from their congressional district for the House and two people from their congressional district for the Senate and sends those names in to the state party and the governor. The state party then has to choose five people for the House and five people for the Senate from statewide. And those nominations go to the governor and he picks one person from each congressional district and two people from the state party's list to serve for that party on the commission. That's how we get to the 20 commissioners. There'll be 10 Democratic commissioners and 10 Republican commissioners who are on that, uh, on that commission. And the parties, I know the, the Democratic things are happening for this coming week. Um, so if you haven't already told people told someone that you want to volunteer. And I know several of you have, but if you haven't already done that, do reach out to the party chairs and, and tell them that you want to be involved. Um, and then as far as the information that they get and the, the structure of all of that, there will be that, that Office of Administration portal on redistricting is the public portal for the commissions. The information that they get will flow through the Office of Administration and specifically the state demographer, who again is has always been a state employee and it's been the same person for 15 years, I think. But um, they will get all of their information from the Office of Administration and they will put anything that they're putting out publicly on that redistricting page. They have to have at least three meetings after they release the draft maps. They can have more meetings than that. They can have them earlier than that. They can have them throughout the process. But the minimum that they have to do is in the 15 days after they release the draft maps, they have to have at least three public meetings. All of that will be determined during their organizational meeting, which happens in August. Okay, and then lastly, I would like to thank you very much for coming and enlightening this sometimes dull, but not tonight, and often confusing um, topic. You've done a great job with it. And I'm going to um, send this over to Mary Lindsay, who is going to show our redistricting song. Just a minute, I'm going to be next. <laughs> Just one oh, thing. Okay. I wanted to, um, again, summarize to all of you who spent your time with us for the last hour that we need you. And again, um, the three things that Sharon Jones challenged us to do was to serve as commissioners, 
volunteer, advocate for fair maps, and participate in the community mapping project. And you're going to keep continue to hear things from us. And you're, if your league wants more information, please contact any one of us. We are trying our best to think of all sorts of ways we can support you and provide you with more information and information that you can take and use. We do appreciate Sharon Jones and she doesn't know it, but we will continue to contact her as we go along to get some really, uh, really um, expertise and helpful guidance. And we um, know that there are a few leagues that are still doing things in this regard. Mary has one um, announcement about Kansas City and then she will start the finale. Um, yes, yes. Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, yes, it was a great uh, talk and I'm certainly happy that I got to be here for it. Uh, but there's gonna be another one, also a part of the People Powered Fair Maps. And that is going to occur, um, it's hosted by the Kansas City League and it will be this coming Tuesday, um, May the 4th at 7 p.m. It's also a Zoom. And um, everybody, even though it's Kansas City, everybody all over the state, anybody who's interested certainly is welcome and invited. Um, to get the link for it, simply go to lwvkc.org. Um, go to the calendar and look at May 4th and 7 p.m. and there it will be. And if you click on that, then you can um, sign up to receive the link. And um, now I think without further ado, um, we're gonna send things off with a, a brand new, this is the first time it's been played, um, a song. Oh, they drew the district boundaries in a manner so obscene. People gathered signatures to make Missouri clean. We cast a million votes with fair elections as our dream. People power makes us strong. When people power pulls together to create a better world forever gerrymandered boundaries will sever people power makes us strong jeff city politicians said oh no this shall not be they created a chicanery they call amendment three to negate election ballots of a strong majority people power makes us strong pulls together to create a better world forever gerrymandered boundaries will sever people power makes us strong with power we are fighting to protect democracy from redistricting shenanigans on fair skullduggery fair and free elections will depend on you and me people power makes us strong when people power pulls together to create a better world forever gerrymandered boundaries will sever people power makes us strong oh when people power pulls together to create a better world forever gerrymandered boundaries will sever people power